All right, you ready to get into the Word? Did you bring your Bible, either on your phone, iPad, whatever it may be, but uh, we're going to get into the God's Word today. Now, we've been, we've been, we, we have been speaking about last day warnings. Jesus talked about the last days. He gave us some warnings. He gave us some signs, but he also gave us some warnings concerning the last days. It's very important that we understand what he's saying. We understand that we, we protect ourselves in doing that. Now, I was using a lot of, a lot of examples uh, concerning the last day warnings, and one of the last day warnings is offense. Everybody say offense. Let me read to you from Luke, the 17th chapter, verse 1. It says, Amen, we shout for the word of God. Then he said to the disciples, It is impossible that no offenses should come. In other words, it's impossible for us to live on this earth with other people. None of us being perfect, except inside of our spirit man is connected with God, but none of us being perfect that somebody somewhere, sometime, does not offend us. And then Jesus said in Matthew, the 24th chapter, verse 10, when he was talking about the last days before the return, before his return, which when you look at all these signs, everything that's going on today, all of what you see today is literally written in the Bible. It's written in the Word of God. Everything that is taking place. And it is happening at a very high speed, fast pace uh, uh, time that, we, that we're, we're seeing this. Jesus made this statement. He said, and many will be offended and will betray one another and will hate one another. Then many false prophets will rise up and deceive many. And because of lawlessness, that's basically because of sin. Uh, because sin will abound, the love of many, and actually the Amplified says the love of the great body, which is talking about the body of Christ, because the love there is agape. You can't have agape unless Jesus is in your heart. So he's actually talking about us as the church. He said, even though we, we know that we, we see so many violent things happening today and people acting in crazy, ma in, in crazy manners and behaviors like we, you know, like we can't even comprehend at times. But Jesus is talking about that the, the lawlessness will abound and the love of many, the love even the church will, it says, will grow cold. And so it's important that we understand that the first part of this and what Jesus was saying is offense, not to be offended, not to be offended. It's impossible that offense comes. But then Jesus made this statement. He said, take no offense. It, you're the one that is determined whether you're going to take the offense or not. Now, I've gotten a lot of feedback concerning this message that uh, I preached last week. And it's a lot of good feedback because people are beginning to examine their own lives and they realize that a lot of weakness and, uh, uh, that, ha that has come into their lives, uh, a lot of turmoil that is happening is because they have been offended at people and they're carrying that offense. And then when they realize that, they begin to, they be begin to you know, forgive and they begin to get things right. And so, so when, when offense comes... Sometimes you can work offense out, literally, especially in a home, even when it's a husband and wife, when, when one or another is offended, you can look at it and say, what offended me, and sit down and say, how can we work this out? Now, remember last week I gave an example of how in a household people can be offended just because the toilet paper, I like to pull it from the top, and he likes to pull it or she likes to pull it from the bottom. Right? And people can get offended how, they, how if a husband puts the, the, the dishes in the dishwasher wrong. But see, this is what you can work out. See, you can, you can put hers over and his under and offended no more. Amen? See, you can work some things out. <laughs> let, me give you, uh, let me give you the definition again of the word offense. And it's the Greek word scandalon. And it means this. It means scandal, to stumble, 
Offenses can cause you to stumble, and we have to be careful that we don't put offense in front of somebody and cause them to stumble. Uh, we'll talk about that later. Uh, it means bait on a trap. In other words, offense, offense is a bait that the devil uses to snare you, to trap you, to, keep, to, to get you bound up. It's, it's a, a, a thing, action, or sin that offends. An occasion to stumble and fall. Now, a lot of times when people say things, they do things, they have no idea that they're offending you. Sometimes we can kind of joke with people. Uh, we can joke with our spouses. And we didn't know, but our joke offended them. Offended them in such a way that, you know... They, they literally can be hurt. They can be wounded by our words and by our, uh, the things that we've said in, in, in offense. And so we have to make sure that, uh, that when we're talking or when we're joking or saying something, let's just make sure that we don't offend somebody in such a way. Because a lot of times our, the way we joke or what we think is funny may not be funny to somebody else. Because you, you don't, even, even your spouse, sometimes you don't even know what happened to them as they were growing up. You don't know what words were spoken over them. You don't know what took place and happened that, that all of a sudden that, that can, you can say something and it'll spark something on the inside of them from a long time ago and they can get offended. And a lot of times what happens is it, it, the little, little teeny offenses that offend us, we just kind of keep it to ourselves we think we just kind of shrug it off until one day something happens and then there's a major explosion. And we wonder, where did that explosion come from? Because what happens is a lot of times when people are offended, they implode before they explode. They, they will keep it on the inside. Actually, some people keep an inventory of offense. You know, and they'll go way back in the past and bring some stuff up. And that, that basically means this. It means that way back when I was offended and I've been carrying this offense the whole time. And then somebody can say, well, I, I, I thought we talked about that. Well, we did, but, you know. So, so you and I have got to be very, very careful that we don't carry this offense. Because when you start carrying an offense, it is a weight much greater than you could ever dream or think about. It is a weight that you cannot carry. Because sooner or later, sooner or later, it's going to take a major toll on you. It will take a toll on you mentally, it can take a toll on you physically, and it can take a toll on you spiritually. So when offense comes, we've got to know how to deal with it. You know, now if I gave an example of you know, coming to a yield sign, the car on the right is supposed to yield, and you're looking and saying they're not going to yield, but I'm not going to yield either because I have the right of way, bless God. And then if they come and you come like that, then, then you're like, hey, you know, what are you doing? I have the right of way. And they're going, oh, oh, oh. and now, now you're offended. Now you got road rage. A little offense of a yield sign now turned into a road rage, and there have been people killed over that. It, 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 it's, it's crazy how things like that happen. I mean, we, we see even now in stadiums with ball games, people get offended because you wear your, your team's jersey and you get right in the middle of the other team and your team is winning and you're standing up and they get offended. And there have been people after the game literally have lost their lives and people have been beat to a pulp because people were offended in what they, what they did. So we've got to make sure that we understand that offense is going to come. Now, let me ask you a question. After last week's message, how many of you this week had an opportunity to be offended? Let me see your hands. Amen? <laughs> it's going to happen. You can be offended at work. You can be offended uh, 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 somebody... Uh, I, I saw where uh, somebody who works at a particular store, uh, a customer walked in and the store had Christmas music on and the person walked up 
to the person working in the store and says, that music offends me. Isn't that amazing? That is absolutely amazing. You know, and, and, and of course, you know, I could, after the fact, you could think of something to say. <laughs> and I could say, well, your statement just offended me. You know, but the fact is, and, and here's the great point. Um, the music didn't stop playing. Because you can't allow one person's offense to you to change what you believe in your heart. And, 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 but one thing that you have to make sure that you do is when that offense happens, you have to, and this comes with, believe me, this comes with maturity. I'm not talking about time the older you get, because I've seen some old people who get offended at everything. So, sometimes they just sit on the front porch barking at people as they come by. I mean, there's plenty of things that you can get offended by. So, so we're not talking about age. I'm talking about your maturity in the Word of God. As you mature and as you renew your mind and mature in the Word of God, then less and less and less that offense is going to be a major factor in your life. The, the quicker you'll learn to forgive, the quicker you'll understand that, you know what, this person must be, I, I thought about, I, I thought after I saw, after I saw that, uh, uh, that, uh, that statement about the, the music, I thought, you know what, this person must be a miserable person. They got to be a real miserable person. They got to be a person that's totally empty on the inside of them. And because they just get, they probably get offended at everything. And I started thinking something probably happened back in their life. Something maybe happened at a church. Something may took place in their family. Who knows what took place. But you know, when I, when I see something like that, and, and, and this has happened to me where people have made statements to me uh, concerning that offended me, uh, and I don't know them, but whenever they would leave, you know, I would just say, Father, I just pray. I don't know what's going on in their life, but I just pray that you'd help them. I just pray that you'd help them and let them come to know your love and your mercy and your grace. Now, I was not like that at one point. I was a born-again, spirit-filled Christian. And when somebody would do something to me, I'm ready to fight. I'm ready to throw down right then. Tava can tell me she's, she's, she's seen times that I was ready to throw down. I mean, we were in New Orleans one time and she was pregnant. And we got out of the car and uh, two people walked by of a certain lifestyle, and they looked at her, knowing she was pregnant, and said to her, we hope it's a boy in a certain way. Well, I was not walking in the fullness <laughs> of the Spirit at that time. I was not as mature as I am right now in the Lord. And so I took off, and she reached out and grabbed me. No, no, don't, don't do that. You know, I mean, it just stirred up my flesh. That's the key. The key is this. We live in this flesh, okay? The flesh that you live in is not born again. It is corruptible. It still has dwelling in it impulses desires and other things that can lead you astray and the devil comes to tempt us through our flesh and when the devil comes to tempt you through your flesh the impulses and the desires that may pop up like that and you're thinking wow wait a minute I got delivered from this I'm not, I'm not living like this anymore I got delivered where did that come from it comes from the flesh the flesh can bring it up the flesh can 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 act in a crazy way at times but now that you have the power of the Holy Spirit on the inside of you, your flesh doesn't rule you anymore. I have to keep my flesh crucified. When those guys said what they said, my flesh that I had on the cross that was crucified, somehow it came down, it got off, it didn't start walking, it started running. 
It was seething. It was mad. It was, it was hot. And, and so you know how at first response, here, here's what we, I need to do a, a message called first responders. What is our first response? Our first response may be out of the flesh. I mean, you may bow up, and you can feel it. I mean, sometimes it shakes. Tava can tell you, used to, listen, I grew up in a town where if you didn't know how to fight, man, you can forget it. It was over with. And so, so we, we kind of, I mean, we did it, but we, we, I mean, we had... Actually, back in those days, they had respect for one another. They didn't shoot anybody or anything. If you're going to duke it out, you just did it, you know. And then afterwards, you hugged one another and, and uh, you know, slipped in one another's blood and stuff like that. But it, it didn't, you know, uh, that was it. And actually, back in those days, if you got in a fight with somebody, they actually respected you. You know, it was different. It's like back in those days, as a handshake. And, 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 and so, so, I... You know, I grew up in that manner, and I grew up, of course, playing sports, and I grew up very competitive. So therefore, competition is in me. It's just, it's just, it's just there, you know, and, and I think that's just the way guys are. You know, it's like people always, people always asking us guys and stuff, why are, why are you always playing in the dirt? Why you love four-wheelers? You know, why do you love hunting, fishing, and all this kind of stuff? Because God created us from the dirt. That's the reason we love dirt. And we love to play in dirt. It's because God created us from the dirt. Now, you ladies may not love all the time playing in the dirt, even though some of you may and love that, but you were created from right below our heart. Amen? To be our queens and princesses there. And that's the reason that the men, we're the protectors. Amen. The, mo- the mothers of the, the ladies are the nurturers, and we're, we are the protectors. That's the, way, that's the way God wired us. But at the same time, we are like our Father in such a way that God is a jealous God. And there's a lot of times there's a righteous jealousness that's on the inside of us. And there's sometimes righteous indignation that rises up on the inside of us. And what we have to be careful of is when that flesh rises up, and it can rise up in the spur of the moment. I, I, listen, I grew up wanting to win, couldn't stand to lose, so I would get mad, angry, upset, you know, if, there was, if, if it, any losing was taking place. So when I got born again, I had to allow God to deal with my anger problem. And because it... it the, the fruit of the Spirit does not manifest immediately the day you get born again. The fruit of the Spirit is like a fruit tree. It takes time for the fruit to grow. It takes time for the fruit to manifest. So that's the reason that when we're young Christians, a lot of times we do things and we make mistakes and we kind of revert back to some of the things that we did before we got born again. It was like, why did I do that? Why did I think like that? I don't know what to, you know, why, why, why did I do that? It's because we're in process. We're in process of being sanctified. We're in process of being conformed to the image of Christ. So I'm not perfect in any way, shape, or form. But I'm better than I was 40-some plus years ago after I got born again. I'm more mature. I can handle things much, much better I can forgive quicker now than I've ever forgiven before. Now, I've learned lessons about not forgiving. I've learned lessons about not forgiving. I've learned lessons about being judgmental and critical. And I learned some of my lessons very hard. And so, so I, I would be offended at things and other people, and, and, and I would become judgmental and I'd become critical. And instead of forgiving, I'd carry that thing on the inside of me. And I paid a price for it. I paid a price. My prayers were not being answered. I paid a, pr- I paid a price physically at times because I, I didn't forgive. I was judgmental. I was critical. And I paid a price because sometimes uh, my prayers not being answered, the very work that I was doing even before I got into ministry was not prospering. And I couldn't understand. I'd get, then I get offended with God. I'm doing all this stuff. 
Where, why aren't my prayers being answered? I don't understand that. And then when you get quiet enough before the Lord and allow Him to minister to you, the Lord will bring up, Son, remember when that person offended you? Yeah, I hope you've done something about that. Boy, do they need to be changed. Man, you need to do something with them. He said, no, I'm not doing anything with them. He said, I'm doing something with you. And until you forgive them, Lord, I didn't, they did that. I didn't do that. They did that. I understand they did it. I was right there when it happened. Well, then you were offended too. No, I was right there when it happened. But I've told you to forgive. I've told you to forgive. Not only did I tell you to forgive once, but he said when Peter asked me how many times that I was supposed to forgive, he said seven times. I think Peter figured I can do it seven times. And Jesus said, no, 70 times seven in one day. 490 times in one day. Okay, there's only 24 hours. <laughs> so, I mean, figure that out. And so I learned in my life that when offense comes, I need to deal with it. If I can go talk to the person, I can go talk to the person. But the person who runs and cuts you off in the highway, you can't talk to them. Now, some of you have tried to follow them to talk to them. But you really can't talk with them. They're gone. Okay? But what you have to do is you have to deal with that offense in your own life. You have to deal with releasing them and letting them go. Can you say amen? amen. Jesus said, again, that offense will be at an all-time high in the last days. The devil wants us to take offense. Why does he want us to take offense? So he can defeat us. Offenses, offenses, if I got enough offenses and, and one is enough. If I've got offenses going on in, in my life, then here's what's going to happen. It causes our love. What Jesus just said, the love of many, the love will grow cold. It causes our love for God, for His Word, the church, and for one another to begin to grow cold. Offenses are big offenses and they're little offenses. But remember what the Song of Solomon says in Song of Solomon 2.15. It's the little foxes that spoil the vine. The little ones that spoil the vine. It's the little offenses that all of a sudden we blow up and, and just grows and grows and grows and becomes bigger and bigger and bigger. It's like a splinter. You ever, anybody ever got a splinter in their hand? I, I'm, I, I'm, you guys that work with wood and everything, I, you understand, but any of us, a lot of us have got splinters in our hands. If it is not removed immediately, it can become a great irritation. And eventually, if it's left in your finger, it can cause an infection. Listen to one of the definitions of the word infection. An influence or impulse passing from one to another affecting feeling or action. So offense like a splinter can literally have an, an influence upon you. There can be impulses that, that rise up on the inside of you. And you can pass that offense from one to another. Not only are you offended at the person, but now you're going to talk to other people about that, that, that offense and what that person does for you. And now you've got a whole group of people that are offended with you, taking your side. Now everybody is a part of this offense. Now it's like a football team. Everybody's coming together. And now we have infected one another with, with offense. Offense can cause you to become aggravated. Aggravation turns into anger. Then I lose my focus, direction. Now my focus becomes the offense of what somebody did to me. And then, uh, then I begin to dwell on it. I begin to meditate on it. And the more I meditate on it, the more I dwell on it, I become bitter on the inside. And if I allow it to stay... I will allow it to become, in my mind, an unforgiving state of affairs. A lot of times when a person is so quickly 
offended. It's because many times we consider ourselves perfectionists. We try to be perfectionists. And I'm going to tell you right now, not, there ain't a human being on the face of this earth that can be perfect. But we try to be perfect. And because we try to be perfect, we expect everybody else to be perfect. So when we expect everybody else to be perfect, then, then we become quickly offended. And we don't allow for mistakes, carelessness, weakness. And basically, a lot of times, we just don't show any mercy. When I get offended, offense can be like the tongue. The Bible tells us in James in the book of James, my offense can become the rudder that guides my life like a boat into the wrong direction. And eventually, if I'm not carrying, I don't deal with this offense, I'm going to end up hitting some rocks or reefs that can bring disability or destruction. Offense also can cause me to turn the steering of my life literally over to the, de- to the, to the devil through his de- deception. And you know where he wants to take you. He wants to take you out of the will of God. I want you to look at John, the 12th chapter. Let's begin reading with verse 1. I want to show you something here concerning offense that, uh, that we have to be very, very careful about in our own lives. The Bible says in John, the 12th chapter, verse 1, Then six days before the Passover came to Bethany, where Lazarus, who, who had been dead, whom he, Jesus, had raised from the dead, there they made him suffer, uh, supper, And Martha served, but Lazarus was one of those who sat at the table with him. Then Mary took a pound of very very costly oil of spikenard and anointed the feet of Jesus, wiping his feet with her hair. And the house was filled with the fragrance of oil. But one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, who would betray him, said, Why was this fragrance of oil not sold for 300 denarii? And given to the poor. This he said, not that he cared for the poor, but because he was a thief and had the money box. And he used to take what was put in it. And Jesus said, let her alone. She has kept this for the day of my burial. For the poor you will have with you always, but me you do not always have. Now think about this. Judas gets offended at Mary's extravagant love and worship. Judas gets offended that Mary is spending this money even on Jesus. Now when you think about it, understand that Jesus, we, we, know, we know that Judas was the treasurer. He's the one that handled the money back. He's the one that budgeted it. He was like their accountant. Uh, He was their overseer. He took care of all the funds that were coming in to the ministry. And we know that people gave to Jesus' ministry. You can find that in Luke, the 8th chapter. It talks about the people and all different kinds of people who gave into Jesus' ministry. So we know that he had had, uh, money coming in. Now, when we think about Judas... Judas must have been gifted at handling money. There must be some background that is there. So often, people can go off course and stray from what is right concerning their strengths, their gifts, and their calling. An accomplished an accomplished and skilled and gifted preacher or teacher can sometimes succumb to their own ego and their own press clippings. And people flattering them. A brilliant banker and investor and accountant can become an embezzler. An empathetic counselor can give in to adultery. The selfish ambition employee and self-made entrepreneurs can begin to take shortcuts and manipulate and begin to tell lies and compromise personal integrity to get what they want in success and still be coming to church. A skilled and anointed teacher can begin to see themselves as better than the pastor and gradually begin to pull people to themselves. And as he or she begins to point out the weaknesses of the pastor, and eventually splits the church. Just because a person is gifted and anointed does not mean that all their actions are approved by God. 
Here's what you and I have to be very careful of in our life. We have to be careful of self-ambition. You have to be careful of envy and strife and jealousy. When other people, you see them gifted and you, you see people being used or somebody talks to somebody but doesn't talk to you, if you're not very careful, you can become offended on that. If you're not very careful, if, if somebody chooses someone and doesn't choose you and you think that you're the one that should be in that position, in that place, you can become offended very easily. And you can start, you can start putting that person down. You can start a personal character assassination. You, you can start lowering them down. A lot of times what, so, what, what's, what, what, what we have to be careful of is I can be offended and when I'm offended... The only way I can raise myself up and feel good about myself is putting other people down. So you, you, have, to, you have to be very careful of that. The Apostle Paul, he even talked about this. This, this is an amazing statement he makes. He said, some, and, and this is in Philippians, the first chapter, verse 15, he said, Son, indeed preach Christ from envy and strife. Wow, that's amazing. Some preach from envy and strife. Some people get envious of somebody else's success. So bless God, I'm going to go off and I'm going to preach. I'm going to do these things. And, and people preach out of envy and strife and jealousy. He said, some indeed preach Christ from envy and strife and some also from goodwill. The former preach Christ from selfish ambition, not sincerely, supposing to add affliction to my chains. But the latter out of love knowing that I am appointed for the defense of the gospel. What then? Now watch this, because here's something I, I want to show you here. Look, look, Apostle Paul. What then? Only that in every way, whether pretense or in truth, Christ is preaching. This I will rejoice. Do you see what Paul just did? Paul took what he saw, people preaching out of self-ambition, preaching out of envy and strife, and instead of Paul being offended at them, you know what he turned? He turns it to the positive. He turns it and says, well, at least Jesus is being preached. At least the gospel is being preached. Everybody may not do the things that you want them to do the way you expect them to do things all the time. But praise God if something good is coming out of it. If, if something good is coming out of it, don't carry that offense in Second. Uh, the second chapter of, of Philippians, it says in verse 3, Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit. Listen, there's nothing wrong with ambition. I've got plenty of ambition. But I found out that after I got born again, that I had to deal with self-ambition. Because, because in this flesh, self will rise up. Self will justify actions and deeds that are not approved by God. Self will come, come up, up, up. And I've got to realize that I, can, I got to deal with pride. I got to deal with ego. I got to deal with self. I got to deal with this flesh. So I, so I realized a long time ago that my ambitions changed. Now my ambition is for the kingdom of God. In everything I do, in word and deed, I do it all in the name of Jesus. So my ambition now is for the kingdom, for the good of the kingdom. And if my ambition is for the good of the kingdom, then I'm doing it out of love. I'm not doing it out of so people can recognize me, I can get reputation, rep, reputation or prestige. I'm doing it for the kingdom of God that God gets all the glory and the honor. Amen? Let nothing be done out of selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind, that's humility, let each esteem others better than himself. Let each of you look out not only for your own interests, but also the interests of others. Apostle Paul said in, um, in 1 Corinthians, I mean 2 Corinthians 10, chapter verse 18, he says this. In verse 17 it says, But he who glories, let him glory in the Lord. For not he... Now listen to this, for not he who commends himself is approved, but the Lord, but whom the Lord commends. Let me give you an example of that. You know, you may be the most gifted, talented person in the world. And you may think, well, 
I'm going to do this and I'm going I'm to accomplish that. There's nothing wrong with it as long as it's out of humility. And it's for the kingdom of God and God's going to get the glory. Kingdom of, the kingdom of God, especially when it comes to church, we're not enterprising. We're not franchising. We're not in competition with other churches down the street. Our competition is the devil. Competing for eternal souls and getting people to get saved. So I'm not, comp- I'm not competing with my brother and my sister, and I'm not competing with anybody that I get up on stage with and I speak with. I, I speak with people in conferences that are incredible orators. They have a master of the English language. And then I come up. I butcher words. <laughs> I, 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 I say things. And, and, and I, I, I'm, I'm not the smartest kid on the block. I do not have an English degree. I do have a psychology degree. And I got that because I wanted to find out why I was crazy. And I didn't find out why I was crazy until after I got born again. But you have, to, you, you, you have to be very careful, very, very careful in how you do things and approach things. You have to be very careful that, 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 that you can be awesome in so many ways. Things you can be, you can actually be the best. You can be the best in the city. You can be the best everywhere. But you've got to stay with a mind of humility. God told the Israelites in Deuteronomy, the eighth chapter, He said, I'm going to bless you. God has no problem blessing you. All you got to do is read Deuteronomy 8. He said, When you have houses, when you have gold and silver, he said, when you have cattle, when you have farmlands, when you have all of these things, he said, don't you forget the Lord your God. It is he who's given you this. This is the reason it's so important with Thanksgiving coming up. That once a year, we don't stand in here and thank God for what he's done. We thank God every single day. We thank God for His grace. We thank God for His mercy. We thank God for the blood of Jesus. We thank God for His forgiveness. Amen? And and, 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 and so so we we have to make sure that, that we don't become like the Israelites because because they did. They they were so blessed that they became very prideful. They became egotistical. And they actually got over into idolatry. They were deceived. And so, God made this statement to them. He said, when you have all of these things, He said, when your heart is lifted up, notice that God did not say, if your heart is lifted up. He didn't say, just by chance, your heart is lifted up. He said, when your heart is lifted up. Every level of success that you have in anything that you do you're gonna to have to deal with a level level of pride you're gonna to have to deal with it because the flesh wants to take credit the flesh wants recognition the flesh wants to say look what I've done the Bible says God will give honor or, or honor give honor to whom honor is due but always remember promotion does not come from the north the south the east and the west if I'm trying to get my own promotion I will manipulate I will I can do all kinds of stuff that is not right. But if I'm waiting for God to, to, uh, to, to promote me and it comes from Him, then I know who it comes from. If it comes from me, I'm going to take the credit. And I've got to make sure. That's the reason that every time when somebody says something about Pastor Al or Tava, you always see our finger go up like this. I got one guy that got so mad at me one time. He said, okay. I'm telling you this, but I don't want you to see you pointing up like that. I said, then don't tell me. I said, that's the easy way. Just don't tell me. Because I am not. I said, I looked at him and I said, I understand where I came from. I was not at the bottom of the barrel. I was underneath the barrel. I had lost everything in my life. 
everything. I had made bad investments, very successful in business, bad investments, bad decisions, alcohol, all kinds of things. I lost every single thing I had. There was only one way to go. That was up. Because you couldn't get any lower than I was lower. Depressed, mad, angry, upset. Until somebody invited me to a Bible study, a small group. I went in with all my junk, all my mess, all my goof-ups, all my failures, everything. My alcoholism, popping pills and all everything that you could possibly think to, to try to find some significance and meaning to life. Offended at everybody because of their success, envy and jealous because I had lost everything, total, complete depression. And then I met Jesus. I'll never forget. You know, that's the reason I say that I only had one step program. I stepped into Jesus. I stepped into Jesus. He changed my whole life. When I got out of that night, I didn't care if I was successful or not. I was driving a, a gas truck, filling up gas tanks at tobacco barns for my dad, making $3.30 an hour. And I was so mad and upset at the world and everything because that's where I was working. And before I was working, I was driving a certain car, expense account, and had all this stuff and investments and, and, and living in Charleston and having a great, great time and, and partying and doing all those things which I thought was the meaning of life. And then through my investments and stuff, I lost every single thing. And I find myself back home driving a truck for my dad, living in my old bedroom, to me, that's the lowest of the lowest. I didn't even want to, I, I wanted to drive the truck, come home. I didn't even want to go out. I didn't want to see my friends or anybody else. Because see, when my friends had seen me before, I was showing everything off. Spending money, had everything, just. But when this came, I had nothing. Actually contemplated suicide. Just want to end it. Couldn't face anybody. When I came out of that small group that night, everything that had depressed me, everything that I thought was the meaning of life had totally gone. I was completely fulfilled for the first time in my life. I had a joy that I tried to get out of a bottle. I tried to get out of success. I tried to get it out of achievements and accomplish, accomplishments. I tried to get it out of relationships, everything. I could not get it out of anything or anybody. No matter what I got, something on the other side would call and say, that's not it, it's over here. 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 And when I got saved... That next morning when I was driving that truck, that was the greatest job I ever had in my life. I was praising and singing and glorifying God and people that I had offense against, I was finding them and telling them, forgive me, I'm sorry, I made mistakes, I got saved now, and they were all looking at me. I mean, they still, today, they still have a problem with believing after over 40 years, that I am still a different person than the person that they knew. Changed my life. And then when I got into the word I had to get before my dad, I put my mom and dad through hell. I was rebellious, stubborn. I, we could just go on and on and on and on. And I'll never forget, when I came home from that Bible study, my dad had already gone to bed. And um, the next day after we came home, when he got in his easy chair there, I got down on my knees and I looked at him and I said, I want you to please forgive me of everything I've put you through, all the hell that I put you through, all the money that I wasted that you bailed me out so many times all the things that you did forgive me 
for what I've put you through. And I had to do the same thing with my mother. Forgive me for what I've put you through. Forgive me. Forgive me that it took so long for me to come out when you gave birth to me. (laughs) I'm going to go all the way back. (laughs) I'm not leaving anything to chance. (laughs) But I said, just forgive me. See, you can, you, can, you, can, you can be offended at anything. And it's important that we understand and we know what it is to forgive because Jesus forgave us. 1 Thessalonians, the second chapter, verse three, second chapter, verse 3 says this, For our exhortation did not come from error or uncleanness, nor was it in deceit. But we have been approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel so that we speak not as pleasing men, but God who tests our hearts. For neither at any time did we use flattering words, as you know, nor a cloak for covetousness. God is witness. Nor did we seek the glory from men, either from you or others. When we had the, we might have because of, uh, of making demands as apostles. Do you notice what he said there? This is something very important. There's a difference between being approved by man and approved by God. The Laodicea church in Revelation, the third chapter, was approved by man, but it was not approved by God. It was a wealthy church. It had everything. A person may have all the giftings in the world, can can have faith, move mountains, prophesy, be successful, have an anointing in such a way that Man, it's just amazing. And yet if that person is not operating out of a heart of love, you know what Jesus said? What the Word of God says in 1 Corinthians 13th chapter? God says, that person's nothing to me. It's nothing. They achieve nothing, accomplish nothing. Everything we do, we do out from the heart of love. Because God loved us. He forgave us. He died for us. So we operate out of a heart of love. Love, 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 love. And love never fails. That's the key. It just never, ever, it it, it just never fails. So there's, there's a lot of times you can see people that operating in the giftings and the anointings of God. You can see people that are very successful. You can see even like the Laodicea church that was extremely faithful. When Jesus showed up, he said, you got everything. You, you said that you have no need of nothing because they were so blessed. And he said, but, he said, I don't approve you. Laodicea church, matter of fact, is the only church that you see out of the seven churches that Jesus addressed that he did not give one commendation, not one, to them. The rest of them says, I know your works, I know you do this and this. Later to see a church, not at all. And you can imagine that somehow even that church had become offended at the Spirit of God. Had become so offended that the Spirit of God was outside the church now. They were going to do their own thing. You, you've got to be very, and, and, and you say, well, I don't know, you know, God, how can you offend God? Well, the whole Bible's full of that. And matter of fact, the Bible says that you can offend the Holy Spirit. Do not grieve. The word grieve there means offense. Don't offend the Holy Spirit of God. So when we look at this, when we look at this concerning Judas, Judas was on the staff. Judas was on Jesus' staff. But Judas' character flaw of greed caused him to become offended at Mary and especially even offended at Jesus, which led him to betray Jesus and brought about the death of Jesus. What was he offended at? He was offended at the generous work of Mary. In other words, what you can see here is that Judas never really loved Jesus. He actually saw Jesus as a ladder and a source For his own ambitions and greed. Isn't it amazing? Some people join churches just for business purposes. Some people come to church just to look at the feel and the sea of people and see them as as a part of their marketing. You should never ever walk into a church where the presence of God is with a heart looking for business. You come in and worship God and worship Him 
and, 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 and you worship him, God will take care of your business. Seek first the kingdom of God, and all the things the world seeks after God will, 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 uh, will add to you. In 1 Timothy 6, chapter, verse 9, it says, But those who desire to be rich fall into temptation and a snare. There's nothing wrong with being blessed. There's nothing wrong with being an entrepreneur. As long as your ambition is not self-ambition, as long as your ambition is for the kingdom of God. Those who desire to be, to, to be rich fall into a temptation and a snare and in many harmful, foolish and harmful lusts which drown men in per, uh, destruction and perdition. For the love of money, not money, but the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil which some, now watch this, Judas, for which some have strayed from their faith in their greediness and have pierced themselves through with many sorrows. The cause of the extravagant of Mary's love Judas was offended. Isn't it amazing how people can get offended when somebody is blessed? Because they think that that blessing should have been for them and not for someone else. And here's a question we'll ask and we'll close with this. I need to find out in my own life. I, even, I have to check my own heart. Am I like Mary who desires to bless people or like Judas? Selfish, greedy, angry, miserable, critiquing, judging, are critical of those who are bountiful in their love, which manifests in a heart of giving. Isn't it amazing that these words that I just read to you, Judas, what he just said, these are the first recorded words of Judas. His words are fault-finding and words of censor, critical, judgmental. Mary's first words in Scripture are found in John, the 11th chapter, verse 32. What does that say? He says, basically, Lord, if you, if you had been here, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. In other words, her first words were, were revealing trust and love and faith. Judas because of his greed, eventually sold out Jesus for 30 pieces of silver. Mary gave Jesus an offering that was two and a half times that amount. Judas kept the money bag in the checkbook from which he stole from Jesus. Mary, on the other hand, loved Jesus so much that she broke her box, her most valuable possession, and gave it all to Jesus. Judas, in turn, sought to turn attention away from Jesus. Mary concentrated all of her attention on Jesus person that's full of self-ambition and is offended, all of, their, all of their attention will be away from Jesus. It'll all be about them struggling. And just think about this. Are we offended when the offering is taken? Are we offended when other people are blessed? If we struggle with giving, then we need to check our hearts. If I have a strong relationship with Jesus, then my heart rooted in the love of God would lead me and be the motivating factor in my life. What was the end result of Judas carrying offense in his heart? What was the end result? He was deceived by the devil. The Bible says in John the 13th chapter, he says that, that the devil put within Judas's heart to betray Jesus. And when he made that decision, it says, then the devil entered into his heart to portray Jesus. Listen to this. Jesus, knowing exactly what was getting ready to happen to him, and Jesus, knowing that Judas was going to betray him, did not take that offense. He simply said, go your way, and do what you need to do. When people are determined to offend you, people are determined to do things with you, the Bible says if it's possible to live with people, to live at peace with people, then do it. Sometimes it's not possible. Sometimes Jesus told Judas, go do, do, go do what you want to do. Go do what you got to do. He already made up his mind he was going to do it. But here's the most, here, here's, here's the most important part of that whole story Jesus knowing he was going to be betrayed got up from the table got a towel and a basin of water and went and washed the feet of his disciples and Judas was in the foot washing 
He was in the foot washing. Jesus was not going to allow that offense to take his focus off the cross. He was not going to allow that offense to take him in another direction that will be out of the will of God. He was determined that he was going to keep his focus and he was going to do what God told him to do. There are going to be people that are going to offend you. They're just going to act that way. And the other thing is, you know, Jesus knew that Judas was going to do what he was going to do regardless of what he would say to him. Some people you just got to let run their course. You can pray for them, but you just got to let them go. But here, here's the other thing too. Jesus forgave him. How do I know that? Because when he was on the cross, he said, Father, forgive them. Judas was in them. When he said them, he didn't just say the Romans. He didn't just, he said, Father, forgive them. For they, he actually forgave Judas. But the fact is that offense and character flaws, greed, anger, and all these things will bring destruction. And that's exactly what happened to Judas. So today, if you're carrying offense, release it. Let it go. Do not carry it. Forgive the person. You can can spend all day long with me after church going, but you don't understand what they've done to me. God knows exactly what they've done to you. I understand that. You have no idea what people have done to me or said to me or, 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 or to just the other day something. Uh, you teach this message, you know you're going to get tested. I mean, just the other day something happened. Okay? But I choose not to get caught up in it. I choose to release and let it go. I choose to let God take care of it. There are times that you have to go to talk to people, and we'll talk more about that. There's times you have to go and talk to people about offense. But don't you carry it. It will kill you. It will destroy you. You must release and let it go. Put it in God's hands. When you release and forgive somebody, it doesn't mean that you forget. You still have a memory bank. But you forgive by faith. And when that person shows up again or that person, that somebody mentions something to you, say, not, no, 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 don't want to talk about that, not going to take it. And the reason being is because I have given that over to God. God's taking care of that and I have dealt with it myself and I'm just not going to get caught up in that. I need to go on to other things. Can you say amen? Amen. amen.